migrating swallows dance above the sun-drenched waters of a reed-laced world. Reed beds work in a fascinating way, their beauty enhanced by the quality and rarity of the inhabitants. In Britain, breeding marsh harriers cling to a reed bed existence. And the bittern occasionally emerges from its secret world. For all of the year, this chameleon-like place, unstable in so many ways, is wrapped in seasonal splendor. Early morning, a water rail looks for food in the marginal cresses of a shallow pool. Here sticklebacks live, a favorite delicacy. The rail will later retreat to the dense forest of reeds, unseen, but identified by its screaming call. At their edge, the reed beds are most vulnerable. They could be considered their own worst enemy. Allowing trees to take over ground, they've struggled hard to win. Initially, they find a foothold in shallow water, where few other plants could survive. Then, by multiplying through an intricate root system, they spread quickly around the edges of deep lagoons, pools, and rivers. The stems that grow from the submerged roots die back each year. In time, a damp mass of decaying reeds and clogged roots rises above the water level and begins to dry out. New plants can now move in. Early settlers include alder, sallow, and buckthorn. If the area remains dry for long enough, birch and hawthorn follow. Years later, the whole reed bed may have been replaced by a stand of oak woodland. In spite of its botanical transience, the scrub-infested edge of a reed bed forms a vital habitat for breeding birds. The grasshopper warbler, newly arrived from Africa, sprays a ratchet call across its territory. A resident male Chetty's warbler announces his intention to acquire property. The reed warbler has arrived, and although it will feed in the scrub, it comes as a new neighbor for the bearded tit, one of the few birds actually locked into a reed bed existence throughout the year. The varied song of the sedge warbler announces its arrival for the northern summer. Warm days of late spring encourage the splendor of flowering hawthorn trees to hem in the reed bed. Their snow white response to the season of growth contrasts with the reed mace, still struggling to find a colorful escape from winter. Last year's reed heads have lost most of their minute seeds, blown by the wind to fresh pastures or consumed by bearded tits in their struggle to survive the winter months. Throughout winter, the root system remained active, producing shoots beneath the water, but now the green stems thrust upward, bearing fresh flower heads. A time of change, new life is expected. The caterpillar of the drinker moth, so named because of its partiality to a drop of morning dew, is tempted to emerge from its winter lethargy by the increased warmth and longer hours of daylight.
both the drinker moth and the reed warbler share a common enemy. To the moth, a predator who can deal with its protective hairy coat. To the other, a parasite of relatively large proportions. The cuckoo. Reed warblers appear nervous at its presence. The reeds may offer dense protection for nesting birds, but the cuckoo will watch patiently for the moment to steal in and lay its own egg alongside those of the other bird. Despite the potential hazard, the reed warbler continues to collect nesting material. The deeply cupped nest is bound tightly to the reed stems by the female. She is encouraged by the male, his only offering towards construction. But later he will assist with the incubation of the eggs. She collects dry grasses and strips of dead reed, a task often involving lengthy journeys away from the reed bed. A shortcut is to steal from the nest of a neighbouring bird, or perhaps from one of the makeshift nests that these birds have a habit of building, some say to confuse the cuckoo. The occupied nests are tightly woven, and may even be reinforced with cobwebs. Four blotched eggs and one of them could be a cuckoo's. For nearly two weeks, the male and the female reed warbler will share the incubation. Male bitterns boom from very early spring to July, the months that the females shoulder all the responsibilities of nest building, incubating and rearing the young. Perhaps the resonant notes warn would-be intruders, keep out, this is my patch. Somewhere in here there's a female doing all the work. To satisfy the young bittern's hunger, the female goes off in search of small fish, an appetizing introduction to the variety of food available in the reed bed. Later the young will progress to eels, frogs and toads and possibly the young of moorhens or coot. Bitterns are secretive, untrusting birds, and it's difficult to work out their precise requirements for success. Some will fly as much as a mile from a reed bed to feed, whilst others may remain in the reeds and not establish breeding territories. At the turn of the century, the bittern was extinct as a breeding bird in Britain, but after natural recolonization from the continent, Numbers climbed to almost a hundred pairs, but more recently have declined to around 50. There seems to be no straightforward explanation for this, although natural succession to drier conditions may be a cause. Young bitterns come in all sizes, and therefore all strengths, because the female began incubating when she laid her first egg. There could easily be a week's difference between them, and such a discrepancy is revealed at moments like this. The first youngster to clamp itself like a vice onto the female's beak does so to stimulate her to regurgitate food from the crop. 
it may take a little time for her to be convinced that this is really what she wants to do. At least one of her young is satisfied, but there are other hungry mouths to be attended to. One factor in the breeding success of bitterns, and it's one that may prove to be highly critical, is the cleanliness of the low-lying water in the reed beds around them. Bitterns will breed only in areas where their food is plentiful, and if the reed beds cannot provide this vital need, then breeding numbers will continue to decline. The Royal Society for the Protection of Birds currently owns and manages reed beds supporting half the breeding bitterns in the British Isles. If levels of pollution are kept tolerably low and more clogged ditches are opened as fresh feeding grounds, it may still be possible for bitterns to survive in reasonable numbers. But due to the drainage of suitable habitat, their chances of reaching the high levels of a few hundred years ago are very slim. early June, and the yellow iris adds a welcome splash of colour to the encroaching sea of green. Here at the dry edges where the reed is tainted by invading scrub plants, the female reed bunting approaches her young. The nest is tucked away close to the ground where convolvulus is gaining a foothold. By mid-June, the yellow traces of last year's reeds have almost sunk beneath the wealth of new shoots. A European swallowtail butterfly, rare inhabitant of East Anglia, feeds on the nectar of marsh valerian. At the edge of its European range, this butterfly survives because of the milkweed, on which its caterpillars are totally dependent for food. There are other rarities in this borderland between reed bed and scrub. Where the damp loving willow bursts into flower, Chetty's warblers have established themselves in the last ten years or so. From its Mediterranean stronghold, the spread of this bird northwards at the turn of the century is one of the most remarkable ornithological events. Rival males vie for territorial rights, the calls of one answered by the vigorous tail flicking of another. Chetty's warblers first appeared in southern England in the late 1960s. They were breeding soon after, and are now established as year-long residents over much of the wet scrub and reed lands of the south. They've proved to be vigorous colonizers. By the end of June, the new reed is in full growth. It rises from the water like an impenetrable wall, slender columns giving shelter and concealment. The bearded tit spends much of its life in this dense forest, taking advantage of the abundant summer crop of insects and spiders. Possibly for the second time this season, it has young to feed, tucked well out of sight in their reed fabric nest. In late June and early July, 
a ready food supply appears. The caterpillar of the twin-spotted wainscot moth. The larvae have grown safely inside the reeds, eating the central pith until ready to pupate. Then, having burrowed out near the top of the stem, they crawl downwards and hide in the litter below. Those that make the journey this far will emerge as adults during August. Many are not so fortunate. They form an important addition to the diet of young bearded tits. By mid-July, blue carpets of marsh forget-me-not appear at the edge of the maturing reeds. And further in, three of the eggs in the reed warbler's nest were destined for an untimely end in the waters below, evicted by an earlier hatching stranger. The female cuckoo has made her mark and now the adult weed warblers must work round the clock to satisfy the endless demands of their foster child. Their parental response to a begging mouth is too strong for them to abandon a monster, which to us is obviously not of their creation. But all is not lost for the reed warblers. They are particularly long-lived, and over the years, they will continue to feed any occupants of their nests. When they avoid the eagle eyes of the female cuckoo, it will be their own young who embark on the late summer migration from the depths of the reed bed. By the time the cuckoo is able to fly, its real parents will have long departed for Africa. Somehow, almost miraculously, it will follow. Instinct guides it south to the equator. Late August finds the young bearded tits moving through the reeds. Theirs is a reed bed existence through summer and winter. But an enforced change of diet lies ahead of them. The easily digested insects and spiders will not last much longer. At this time, the reeds begin to undergo internal changes. The sugar content moves back down to the rhizomes, and this, in turn, attracts vast numbers of the plum reed aphid. Their fine, piercing mouthparts penetrate the reed and siphon off the sweet sap. The aphids arrive in such large quantities that sedge warblers rely on them totally as a fat-building source, sustaining them on their unbroken migration to Africa. Purple heads are once again flush with minute seeds which will float away on the wind in their thousands. Most will perish, but just a few may settle, embryo-like, and take root. Tiny filaments of life striving to give birth to a new reed bed. But this has little to do with the future of the parent bed. It survives by virtue of its fast-spreading root system, already storing food to face the coming winter. The transition is abrupt. Green has once more become yellow, and now in places, white, as the first snowflakes settle on the feathery traps held aloft. Summer visitors have gone, and only those birds with some inbuilt resistance to a temperate zone winter can survive here now. The newspaper of events is easily read in the snow. A bittern has passed by in search of open water in which to feed. If it is not available, 
it may die of starvation. Fortunately, this is a fate held in store during only the severest of winters. The birds that stay behind do so because they're adapted to survive the average conditions, those concerning temperature and food availability that a reed bed existence imposes on them during the winter months. At its cruelest, starkest time, the beauty of a reed bed somehow seems to be heightened. Ice-free waters in the very heart of the reed bed attract wildfowl in large numbers. And despite the economy of life in winter, teal are undergoing the preliminaries of courtship. Shovelers, attracted by the teal, begin their descent while creeping ice forces the hungry water rail out of its customary cover. In the heart of the reed bed, the bearded tit families have flocked together. With their insect food completely gone, or at least too well hidden for them to find, they harvest their share of the plentiful seeds that each reed head produces. The seeds are very small, and the birds must spend most of the limited hours of daylight hard at work. But man also has an interest in reeds. The traditional art of thatching requires certain areas of reed bed to be managed for this purpose alone. Commercial reed beds are cut and cleared every year or two to keep the growth straight and strong. Hardly any reed cutting takes place before early January when the frost has killed the leaves and they've fallen to the ground, leaving the raw material of thatching standing in thick, accessible groves. These areas, solid underfoot and providing a high quality plant free from litter at its base, are the reed cutter's ideal. By simple irrigation, the reed bed is kept damp enough to sustain its yearly growth and the cutting removes the danger of scrub encroachment. But such areas are not ideal for the birds who nest and feed low down, where there is an accumulated litter from past years. There need not, however, be too much of a conflict between conservationist and cutter. Much of Britain's reed is confined to protected reserves, and it's managed in such a way as to keep it both ideal and more permanent for birds. The maintenance of our existing reed beds as permanent places for birds is a difficult task. The very nature of a reed bed is one of continuous change. The leading edge ploughing its way through open water, the training edge drying out and being taken over by advancing scrub. Halting such a powerful process in its tracks will be complicated and expensive. And yet, if we are to maintain valuable communities of wildlife, it must be attempted.
Only then can we hope to ensure the survival of such rarities as the Marsh Harrier, a bird of delicate and graceful charm, whose continued existence depends almost entirely upon the future of our secret reeds. <laughs>